All praises to Ahaya, Wawarakadash, Bahashem Yashaya. That's all praises to the Father and the Holy Spirit in the name of the Son. Shalom, family. Let me tell you, I'm not going to talk a whole lot right now. We're just going to jump into part two. The seer sent me this second part of this revelation that he had. So here y'all go. Revelation from the seer, part two. <clears throat> well, good morning, everyone. And morning to all people also out the Lord's people out there. Uh, today I want to follow up a little bit from last week when I talked about the 10th and 11th chapter of Isaiah. I want to kind of put it in a broader context and I have some really exciting things to share. First I want to clarify a couple of things from last week. Uh, because of my experience and education in the sociology of racism, I'm very sensitive to stigmas that different groups of people have. And Isaiah used the term uh, Sumerians and Samaritans in a way to, that shows that there's a stigma against them in their moral conduct. So I want to explain that a little bit so you understand that and uh, how that came to be. I don't want to spend much time on that, but I want to be able to uh, <clears throat> clarify that. The Samaritans had a temple in competition with the temple in Jerusalem. And you'll find in the New Testament that... Uh, the woman at the well said the Jews have no business or no dealings with the Samaritans. And that's because in Samaria, the people who went there and who ended up living there were the ones who were outcast from Jerusalem because there was a, a rivalry in their religion. And so they, they stigmatized them as something less morally inferior and so forth. And that went on. In Isaiah's time, that had already had been taking place. He was about 700 B.C. And then when the exile took place, the, return, the people that returned from the exile, the women who had been abused in Babylon and their children, ended up there. And so the whole place had a stigma of the children being illegitimate and so forth. But the Lord pushed back against that when he had his Good Samaritan parable. And he pushed back against it when he said, who is without sin, cast the first stone. And then he really pushed back against that when he went to Samaria and he ministered there and he went to their homes and he ate with them and stayed with them in their houses, something that a Jew would never do. So he was loudly proclaiming that he didn't see any stigma on the Samaritans. Okay, so... Another uh, thing I would like to clarify, and this I'm going to go through this really quick, just because it's important for students uh, out there and you guys as you study. I want to. Re some of you know some of this, but I want to remind you of some things here. And I want to just go over really fast the the, the code that I skipped over last week in Isaiah. Now, in Isaiah, from verse, in chapter 10, verse 28 through 32, Isaiah in, inserted an exercise for the students of the prophets. And in his day, there was no Strong's Bible Dictionary, and people of other languages, unless they knew Hebrew and didn't just learn it on the street, but learned it in formal education, didn't know how to read the prophetic code and the prophetic code is to use the names proper names not for the place or the person that they refer to but for the meaning of the word and so nobody could look up the word because the way the hebrews learned their language was they had a root word and they, all the kids learned the root word in school and then they learned the words that came from that root word and oftentimes 
the prophets would use, starting with Isaiah and this little exercise, they would use a word that was a proper name, and the meaning they would intend maybe even go clear back to the root word. So this is, a, this is the code that goes through all of Isaiah and almost all of the Old Testament prophets. So I'm going to read 28 and 32 as recorded in your King James Bible. And you'll be able to see that this is perfectly nonsensical. It doesn't mean, as it's written, it doesn't mean anything. Okay? And he came to Ayath. He passed to Migran. At Mishmach he had laid up his carriages. They are gone over the passage. They have taken up their lodgings at Geba. Rama is afraid. Gibeah of Saul is fled. Lift up thy voice, O daughter of Galam. Cause it to be heard unto Laish. O poor Anathoth, Madmena is removed, and the inhabitants of Gebam gather themselves to flee. As yet shall he remain at Nob that day. He shall shake his hand against the mount of the daughter of Zion, the hill of Jerusalem. Nobody knows, has, can give that any meaning. So then you look up those words, and I'm going to go through these quickly. And you, you'll just have to listen to this or read my notes if you're here. You won't be able to copy this down as fast as I'm reading it, but it'll be recorded. Ayath is from 5857, comes from 5856, it means a ruins. Migran, 4051, comes from 4048, the precipice, a place to give up. Mich Michma, 4363, there's a typo in my notes, so that's probably a bad number means his hiding place. The passage is 4569. It means the crossing place. Geba, 1387, a hillock, and a hill represents man's government, and mountains represent God's government. Ramah is 7414 from 7413, the seat of idolatry. Carriages, 3627, means weapons. Gibeah, 1390, means a little hill or a little government. Galam, 1554, a spring of water. Laish, 3919, from 3918, means to be crushed. Anathoth, 6068 through 6067, to answer or to give an accounting, from 6030. Madmena is 4088, from 4087, means a dunghill. Okay, now I'm just going to read it with that in with those translations. Oh, and Gibbon, Gibeon means cisterns, and Nob is 50:11 means fruit. All right. He is come to. This is now referring to last week when I read about the deep state, the ruling elite, the Assyrian. Remember that. This is the Assyrian. The Assyrian has come to ruin. He has passed over his precipice, his place to surrender. At his hiding place, he has laid up his weapons. They are gone over the crossing place, which means he's gone past the point of no return. They have taken up their lodging at the place they still control. The seat of adultery is afraid. Their ability to request quarter is fled. Lift up thy voice, O daughter of the living waters. Cause it to be heard unto the place of their crushing defeat. O poor ones, who now must give an accounting, the dunghill is removed. And he's referring to Saul's little government. It's so little, such a little hill, it's called a dunghill. The inhabitants of Saul's false cisterns gather themselves to flee. They don't, they don't have the living water. As yet, he remains at the place where he will harvest the fruits of his doing that day. He shall shake his hand against the mount of God, the daughter of Zion, the ruler of Jerusalem. And now that's all I'm going to say about that. That's for students to know how to do that code. But I am going to add one more thing, and that is that code extends into the New Testament. And I want to explain to you how that works. The New Testament, let's say we don't know all of what was written in Greek originally, but we'll assume that it's all written in Greek. When John wrote the book of Revelation, he wrote it, it's written in Greek. 
And what you have in your Bible is a translation from the Greek into English. He picked the Greek word intending it to mean the Hebrew meaning. So when you read the book of Revelation, look up the English word, not in the Greek, but in the Hebrew. And it will tell you exactly what he's talking about. When he talks about the the seals and so forth in, in the book of Revelation, I'll give you one little example. He says that the deep state, and this is correlating with chapter 10 of Isaiah, the deep member says that he will move the boundaries of the people in, in chapter 10. Well, how it's spoken of in Revelation is all the green grass will be burnt up. Look up green grass, boundaries of the people. Are you, so you get it? So in the book of Revelation and in the New Testament, the prophecies in the New Testament, especially John, when you read a word in English, look it up in the Hebrew, even though he wrote it in the Greek, and you will find that the answer to that code. Okay, now, I'm going to go then now with the topic for today. There are two kinds of prophets that I'd like to compare for just a second. Jeremiah was a certain kind of prophet, and he preached repentance to nations, rulers of nations, and their people. That's what he did. Isaiah preached the preparation of faith. He didn't preach repentance. There was repentance in what he preached, because in order to prepare to have faith and confidence in God, you have to do repentance. So... He did that to bring control of his world so that people into the eyes and the minds of his people so that they would know where their world was going, the context, the worldview that told them how to understand the situations that were they were confronting. And what I read to you out of Isaiah 10 and 11, what I explained there was the situation we now face in our world today in times of tribulations. And all through history, the word tribulations has only applied to our day. It could, have, it could have applied to the Jews when Jerusalem was destroyed, and there could have been other times when Babylonians took them into captive. But those were momentary compared to the tribulations that are going to be worldwide and are worldwide at this time. So, that is the difference between Jeremiah and and Isaiah. So I want to I want to talk to you now about I want to give you a metaphor. I'm going to draw a straight line on this on this blackboard. Okay. And it's going to start out good. It's going to be a story of a merchant's life. He starts out and he builds his business And it grows and it grows. And he has the best produce of anybody around. He has everything. He has food. He has clothing. He has hardware. He has the most beautiful buildings. He has the best parking lot, the best servants. And finally, he has everything that the world needs to be happy. Everybody wants what he sells. Everybody wants his business. And then his help starts to fail. And they start to be selfish and dishonest. And then his building doesn't get maintained. And then he has a bad reputation because some of the food he sold made people sick. And then finally it gets so bad that he starts losing money. Finally it all goes to pot and he has to burn it down. Just burns it down and gets rid of it. It's beyond fixing. God doesn't work like that. If the fire when the fire destroys the world at the end of days, if it was like the merchant who failed, God would have failed. He has no intention of creating a world as perfect in Eden and letting it go to where it's so bad he has to bring the flood. That didn't end the world, and neither will the fire that destroys the wicked the second time end the world. So the, the end times that the prophets talk about are not 
in most cases, the end of the world. Their end of a world, not the world. So, God is different. He doesn't go in a straight line. The works of God are one eternal round. And you've heard this before. All of you everywhere know that. This isn't new. And so God, as He is one eternal round, and there are seven worlds in God's plan. And that is not a that's not just an idea, that's widespread. And it is from very ancient times this first one would be Eden. And God, it was perfect. I, God, saw that all things were good. God's going to go from Eden around and back to Eden. His, his job as God isn't to start out perfect and end up in disaster. His job is to start out perfect and end up perfect. And He's in control of everything in between. Now, I want to read to you... Uh, and this is from an ancient writings. This came about, oh, I think it's 200 B.C. And this is the Jewish idea of what's known of the seven worlds. Okay, these seven things that I've just indicated on this, on this blackboard. I'm just going to number them. All right, and and the way they talk about it, this is in the 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 book of the patriarchs. This is in the testament of Levi, and this will be the seventeenth column uh, in the writing by Charles Worth, the Pseudepigrapha, page seven ninety four. Because you have heard about the seventy weeks, listen also concerning the priesthood. They're going to describe the seven worlds in, char- in, ch- in terms of priesthood. In each jubilee, and what they're calling each one of the seven worlds is a jubilee, there shall be a priesthood. In the first jubilee, the first person to be anointed to the priesthood will be great, and he shall speak to God as Father, and his priesthood shall be fully satisfactory to the Lord. In the days of his joy, he shall rise up for the salvation of of the world. Okay? The first one, the first priesthood here is Yatsakad or Adam. And I know Christians blame him for the first original sin and all that, but all through Jewish history, Adam was highly respected and considered to be very holy. The second, in the second Jubilee, the anointed one shall be conceived in sorrow of the beloved one and his priesthood shall be prized and shall be glorified by all. Okay, the next one is Noah in the second world. Conceived by the beloved one, his mother's name was Boten. The word Boten means the one with a sacred womb. Okay, the third priest shall be overtaken by grief. Jeremiah. Read the book of Lamentations. Tell me if he was overtaken by grief. The fourth priesthood shall be suffering because injustice shall be imposed upon him in a high degree and all Israel shall hate each one his neighbor. The Lord Jesus. Let me read that again. 
He came in the meridian of time. The fourth one is the middle. The fourth priesthood shall be with sufferings, because injustice shall be imposed upon him in a high degree, and all Israel shall hate each one his neighbor. After Christ's crucifixion and suffering, Jerusalem was destroyed because the Israelites were ungovernable. The fifth shall be overcome by darkness. So, here in the fifth, what the prophetess was here, it was overcome by darkness. It could be James Thoreau, could be Joseph Smith, could be other people who had the light of God and it couldn't go far. Likewise, the sixth and the seventh. All right, so we're talking about there's, there's going to be darkness in, in here. And that was a little past his, under his skill level, a little bit over his skill level. It says on further here, in the fifth week, they shall return to the land of their desolation and shall restore anew the house of the Lord. In the seventh week, there will come priests. All right, so he's going back to the fifth week, and then uh, this is the sixth. The seventh is the millennium. Right here, between the sixth and seventh, is the second coming. And right here, between the fifth and sixth, is the arm of the Lord. Right here. All right. Now the Hopis have the same thing. They have the seven worlds. If some of you have access to such things and you want to look up something about the Hopis and their seven worlds, or at least the prophecies, sometime about 1982 or three, the Hopi elders who have stone tablets and who have interpreted them, went to the United Nations and warned the world of what we're experiencing right now. And that's in, that will be in the archives of the United Nations, Hopi prophecies to the United Nations. And it was the elders went there and they addressed the whole world body and shared their prophecies with them. Just before that, or just after that, the Iroquois in Canada, they shared their prophecies with the federal government. I think it was the president or somebody in Washington. I'm not sure just who they went to. They might have went to the UN too, I'm not sure. But they have what's called a prophecy stick. And it's a long walking stick. And it's carved, and it's hundreds and hundreds of years old. And they had instructions from the time they first got it, centuries and centuries ago, that when the carving on the top of the stick was fulfilled, they are to warn the whole world of what comes next. And when those prophecies were fulfilled in the, in the early 80s, they took their stick to Washington and explained it to somebody, the leaders there in some form. And so that's where that was. And I want to tell you really quick a little a little experience. My wife and I were living at Pinon Mesa in Old Cedar Valley, Old Cedar Village, I mean, on the reservation. And right beside us, a mile away, was the Hopi reservation line. And we went over there to get water from Cat Springs once a week. And there was a, a well tender who was a Hopi and his wife, an old person, old people. And they were really good friends and good, good folks. And one day, in the, in the evening, the starry skies were bright. They always are. We were at 7,000 feet on top of that mesa. And I was just sitting there, and I was looking at the sky, and I saw a blue star. 
And as I was looking at it, I realized it was moving. I thought, well, it must be a satellite. And there were satellites in those days. That was back in 76. We're just starting to have them, I believe, 77 maybe. And I thought, whoa, that that star is moving. That's that's a satellite. And as I'm sitting there, it stopped. I thought, well, it can't be a satellite. They don't stop. And it stopped right over Old Oribe. Old Oribe is a... The Hopi village that they still do things the way they've done them for a thousand years. They don't have any any modern conveniences. They don't allow fo- telephones or anything electric or photographs or anything about that there. No vehicles. They still live in, in the ancient way. It's the longest inhabited city on the continent. And you can see the silhouette of that mesa in the night. And right over Old Arabi, that star, that star stopped. And it was a bright blue. No other star was like it. And it was big. Uh, that thing stopped. So I went up and I got Shache out of bed, the grandfather, my grandfather. And I said, I want to show you something. And he came out, and kind of rubbing his eyes. I woke him up. And I said, see that star over Old Arabi? It was moving. It came from clear over here, and it went over around Ribe, and now it stopped. It's still there. And he says, oh, it's just the end of the world. Go back to bed. I said, it's just the end of the world. <laughs> and so the next morning I asked him, what does it mean that that's just the end of the world? And he said, the Hopis have a prophecy that when the blue star appears and it starts coming to Ribe, that's the end of the fifth world. And the sixth world is about to emerge. All right? That's what he told me. So there you have that. And then I want to read another thing about our day and about prophecy. This one's from Enoch. And again, I'm going to Charlesworth Pseudepigrapha. And this is written 400 B.C. according to the writings here, the people who date this. And I want to read this paragraph. It's the opening paragraph on the first scroll, first column or the first page of the scroll. And this had to be the scribe of Nehemiah, who was named Zadok. Uh, he had to find some record, or somebody had to translate from stone tablets into language, because when Enoch lived, there was no written language in the terms of words. So... Zadok probably was the one who brought this forward. And the scenes were called the sons of Zadok because of of that man, Zadok, who was the scribe of Nehemiah and his librarian and his keeper of his archives. The blessings of Enoch, which things he blessed the elect and the righteous who would be present on the day of tribulation. Right there, you know it's talking about our day. At the time of the removal of all the ungodly ones, We're talking about the time when all the wicked ones are destroyed. It's this be by fire. And Enoch, the blessed and righteous man of the Lord, took up this parable with his eyes while his eyes were open and he saw. And he's, he's a seer. And he said, This is a holy vision from the heavens which the Irkadeshi showed me. And I heard from them everything and I understood. I looked not for this generation but for the, the distant one that is coming. I speak about the elect ones and concerning them. And I took up with parables saying, listen to this, the God of the universe, the Holy Great One, will come forth from His dwelling. This isn't the second coming. This is the arm of the Lord where He reveals Himself to be everywhere and He is dwelling in everything around you. And from there he will march upon Mount Sinai and appear in his camp, emerging from heaven with a mighty power. And everyone shall be afraid, and the Irkadeshi and the watchers will quiver, and the great fear and trembling shall seize them unto the ends of the earth. And the mountains and the high places will fall down and be frightened, and the hills will be made low, and they shall melt like the honeycomb before the flame. This is in Isaiah. Isaiah is quoting here when he quotes that in his writings. 
And the earth shall be rent asunder. Remember, in the seals there will be a great earthquake, and the earth will run like a chaste roe, which is a, like a deer. And all that is upon the earth shall perish, which, of course, is not exactly complete. There's going to be a remnant. And there shall be a judgment upon all, including the righteous. And it shall be the righteous, he will grant peace. And to the righteous, he will grant peace. And he will preserve the elect, which tells you that's not going to be all. And kindness shall be upon them, and shall all belong to God. And they shall prosper and be blessed, and the light of God shall shine unto them. Behold, he will arrive with ten million of the Irkadeshi in order to execute judgment upon all. And he will destroy the wicked ones and consume all flesh on account of everything that they have done, that which the sinners and the wicked ones committed against him. So there is another time in the writings of Enoch that talks about our day and that the events there are not the end of the world when all the wicked will be destroyed. Now I want to read you something from the, the, the church in Christ's day. And this is on page 170 in DuPont Summer, the scene writings from Qumran. And this, and from here I'm going to go to Isaiah because Isaiah is the, is the point of this and he's the one who has this marvelous message for you today that you should rejoice. And the king of the Katim, which is the king of the wealthy, the king of the enemy to the poor, shall enter the world. This is Trump. And he's not the enemy to the poor, but the people who are his colleagues are the other billionaires and so forth and in his time he shall set out to pray to violent fury to battle against the kings of the north he's the king of the south and in his anger he shall seek to destroy and wipe out the horns of his enemies horns that mean strength now that sounds ominous the next sentence this shall be the time of salvation for the people of God and the hour of dominion for all the men of his lot, and of final destruction for all the lot of the adversary, Belial. And there shall be immense confusion for the sons of the pit. And Babylon, the Assyrians of Ashur, will fall without the help from any man. They won't fall because they lost the war. God is bringing salvation to his people. <coughs> and he's bringing dominion for all the sons of his lot. And he's destroying the wicked. And the dominion of the wicked shall perish, that wickedness may be crushed without a remnant and without any survivor for all the sons of darkness. Okay, now this, then that's the seventh line. Now I'm going to read the eighth. It goes on from there to indicate that this is not the end of the world. Then, the sons of righteousness shall lighten all the ends of the world progressively. I'm going to move out and bring the light and truth of God will cover the earth like a flood. They're going to light and enlighten all the ends of the world progressively until all the moments of darkness are consumed. Then, in the time of God, his sublime, sublime greatness shall shine for all the times of the ages unto gladness and blessing. There will be never anything like it before that truth and righteousness will sweep the earth like it's going to. Glory and joy and length of days shall be given to all the sons of light. So, it's important to know that the second... prop. The, the, here's the flood... Right here is the flood, and between Eden and the flood, there was a great dispersal. And I'm writing that on the board, okay? 
First of all, the, the first family, when Cain killed his brother, the family dispersed. A third of them dispersed. And there was more dispersals later that wasn't just from that when they went to Qatar and different places. And then at the flood, there became the Tower of Babel. So not only did they disperse prior to the flood when all of Noah's children left except for one and all of Melchizedek's children left except for one, <coughs> and they only left three people to deal with the flood, three men, this dispersal continued after the tower and it, con- and it continued. But here, at this, at this place, which is the opposite of over there, there's going to be the great gathering. So, he's headed back to Eden. He's dispersing. He's given everybody their chance to decide what they're going to do with their gift of life. He intervenes with the arm of the Lord. He intervened with the flood. He intervened with the arm of the Lord. This is when Babylon will fall. Babylon will fall at the end of the fifth world. And the emergence of the sixth world is the arm of the Lord. And Isaiah has some really important things to tell you about that. And I'm going to go to 65. And I'm going to read 17 to the end. And I want you... Boy, uh, listen good right here. This is your hope. This is your salvation. Okay, now, in the 65, first of all, in 30, 30th chapter, I want to read 30, 30. <clears throat> this is Isaiah 30, chapter 30, verse 30. Makes it easy to remember. And the Lord shall cause His glorious voice to be heard. Right now that's happening. This is part of a prophecy. People, there's great awakening. People are hearing the Spirit all over the world, especially in our country, what I know about. And shall show the lighting down of His arm with His displeasure against sin and His dismay and with the flame of devouring fire with scattering of tempest and hailstones. Hailstones is a code word for the unknown, the unexpected, surprises that come upon the wicked. All right, now I'm going to go back and read this 65, 17. This is talking about the same time. Okay, so in 65 up to this time, and in 64, he's dealing with Isaiah about preparation for the arm of the Lord. I'll read, let's see, I'll read, start with 16. He's talking about the people who, that, that he was talking about in 10, in 15 and 16, he's saying, And ye shall leave your name for a curse unto my chosen. For the Lord God shall slay thee and call his servants by another name. And he who blessed himself in the earth shall bless himself in the God of truth. And he that sweareth in the earth shall swear by the God of truth, because the former troubles are forgotten, and because they are hid from mine eyes. For behold, this is 17, For behold, I create a new heaven and a new earth, and the former shall not be remembered nor come to mind. That is not the end of the world. That's the arm of the Lord. The new heaven and new earth isn't after everything passes away, although... After the millennium, he doesn't have to create a new heaven and new earth. He just has to transform the temporal world back to the natural world of Eden. But here, at the fall of Babylon, here, when the Assyrian and the wicked are destroyed without a remnant, he's creating a new heaven and a new earth. In other words, all the former things are passed away. All the tribulation times are gone. Therefore, 
But be ye glad and rejoice forever in that which I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem a rejoicing and her people a joy. Now it's going to go on to tell you that this isn't the end of the world. Okay? And I will rejoice in Jerusalem and joy in my people. And the voice of weeping shall be no more heard in her nor the voice of crying. There shall be no more thence an infant of days, nor an old man that hath not filled his days. For the child shall die a hundred years old. In the millennium, nobody's going to die. So you know that this fire that's coming, the end, is not talking about the second coming and the start of the millennium. It's talking about the sixth world, not the seventh. Okay. But the sinner, being a hundred years old, shall be accursed. And they shall build houses and inhabit them. After the end of the world, you won't be building houses. And they shall plant vineyards and eat the fruit of them. All this won't happen after the second coming. And they shall not build and another inhabit, but they shall not plant and another eat. For as the days of a tree are the days of my people and mine elect shall long enjoy the work of their hands. And they shall not labor in vain. Remember now, in the millennium, there's what labors are there? It's, it's not a temporal world. Nor bring forth for trouble, for they are the seed of the blessed of the Lord and their offspring with them. And it shall come to pass that before they call, I will answer. And while they are yet speaking, I will hear. And the wolf shall feed together and the lamb and the lion shall eat straw like the bullock, and the dust shall be the serpent's meat, and they shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, saith the Lord. So you've heard that a little child shall lead them. You remember all that? All that new heaven and new earth thing is just a little ways away. Just a little ways away. Could be a year. <clears throat> we don't know when, it doesn't matter. Because we know what's coming now. These guys, the wicked here, they got progressively worse, progressively worse, until there was a flood and they had to be destroyed. Here, the wicked are going to be progressively more afraid and more afraid until finally at the, day, at the judgment at the end of the millennium. I would just hate to be in their shoes. Because here in the sixth world, first of all, all the things that they live their life for are going to go away. No more technology. No more decadarchy. That means electricity, petroleum, and so forth. All the things that they live for are going away. Their luxuries, their, their status, their licensing, their positions, their credibility, all the things they're able to do, what they call success, their wealth, their relationships, everything that they love is going to go away. But for the righteous, everything they love is on the horizon. And what is happening right now with you and with all the people of the Lord throughout our country and the world in this great awakening is the Lord is right now preparing the people for the arm of the Lord and he's getting us ready for the great gathering. When we, all of us, thousands, millions of us, and I could read to you about in 64 of Isaiah about that, the world is going to be totally surprised that there is an entire multitude of righteous people remaining after the arm of the Lord and the fall of Babylon. They think they have everybody. They think they have control like they have of Samaria, they have control of Jerusalem. They think they just because they have control of all the perverts and everything else out there and the wicked, they think they have control of the righteous. But the Lord is doing His work among His people. <clears throat> He's getting us ready for the great gathering right now. <clears throat> and we are in, in the war scroll terms, we are in between either the last part of seven lots we're either in the last part of the fifth or the first part of the sixth. By the way, this follows through everywhere. You read in the New Testament about the third heaven and the seventh heaven. 
even the next life is divided into seven epoch of t- epochs of time. So they not only does this world divide it into seven periods, seven beginnings and seven endings, heaven is divided into seven beginnings and seven endings. So <clears throat> as you look forward here, what did he say? Do not be afraid of the Assyrians. Remember that? For he will smite you for yet a very little while and the indignation shall cease. Keep your eye with your children and your family. If we get under occupation and oppression, they start taking our kids to public schools or wanting us to have mandatory vaccinations, which I think is the next plague. Keep your eye, no matter what happens to you, wherever you are, on just a little while, we'll have a new heaven and a new earth. And everything you dream for, everything you want for your family, everything you want for the Lord, will be yours. And you'll be unobstructed. And no one can stop you. And you will lay hold of the prey like a lion in the wilderness. And no one will be able to deliver the prey out of your hands. And if you decide... You're going to bring the truth and light to somebody. There's nothing in your way and you will be endowed with power from on high and people who thought they never could receive light and were past the point of no return can be blessed by your ministry and be find their redemption in the Lord. That's going to happen and it's very soon. We're already being prepared for it. All of the seals and the vials and the trumps have been open and sounded and poured out. They started in 1987 and commenced every three and a half years after that and they are continuing and someday I'll give you information about the book of Revelation and all that, what that means. I might put it in the handbook of established righteousness. So rejoice and look forward and don't worry about these ruling elite and all their mandates and all their plans of taking your freedom of speech and your liberties and your government and your families. They want to do away with the Western nuclear family. Don't worry about all that and keep your eye with confidence and faith that right on the horizon before your eyes of every human being so that every tongue will confess and every knee will bow, they'll have to acknowledge that, the, that they can sense and feel the presence of the Son of God in every single thing around them. That's why Babylon will fall, because nobody can be motivated enough to continue their sin in the presence of the Lord. And Isaiah actually says, from that day on, the wicked will have to sin in his presence. And so that's going to come. And it's going to come in the height of trouble. And if the Lord didn't shorten the time, everybody could be destroyed. But he says in the seventh lot, he will redeem his people and save his people in this battle. And we're in, we're starting into the sixth. And you will see in the next few weeks to come a decisive thing about the way our government's going to go and the way the world's going to go. And we'll know for sure exactly whether we're in the last of the fifth or beginning of the sixth at that time.